Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for everyone who's gathered here today, God. Um, I pray that you just speak to us through Michael tonight, God, and that we know that in you alone we can reach people, and in you alone uh, our faith should be placed. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, I just want to say I'm so thankful for Zachary and Kayla and the rest of our students who led tonight but also lead every single week. Uh, they do an awesome job of stepping in and leading you guys in worship. And uh, they're just awesome members of our SWAG team. Uh, SWAG stands for students willing and able to go. And uh, we have students that serve in our tech and on stage in the band. We have students that serve in our children's ministry. Uh, we have students that serve all over the place. And we want to invite you, if you're not a part of our SWAG team already, which just means that you're a part of our, our group of students that serve in our church and student ministry, I invite you uh, to become a SWAG member. Uh, there's like an application, you pick one up tonight, and ready to go. Also, this Sunday, we're going to have a special training for all swag people and people interested in serving. Uh, so from 12.30 to 3.30, there's going to be a special training. Uh, Pastor Allen's going to be here talking about first impressions, how you can become an awesome person at greeting and welcoming people to the church, how you can make people feel uh, like they belong, all those kinds of things. Uh, then Miss Kathy's going to be here talking about children's ministry, how you can serve in the children's ministry, just little tips and tricks uh, so you can jump in. So if you're helping out on a Sunday morning in a classroom, or if you're going to help out VBS, that'll be helpful for you. Uh, also, that'll help whenever we do our kids sports camp over the summer as well, so good training there. And then uh, Nathan and James uh, will be here to talk worship and tech team. Uh, from 2.30 to 3.30. Uh, so there's opportunities for you to serve in all different places in our student ministry and in our church, and we invite you to be a part of that. Uh, so if, if you're interested, come talk to us tonight. We'll get you plugged in. And also you get a free lunch. So we'll pay for your lunch if you want to stick around on Sunday and come for that. So there's that. Okay. I'm going to warn you up front, okay? Um, this message was as hard... This message was hard on me because it made me examine myself. So I'm going to warn you tonight that as we get into the Word, imagine there being a mirror in front of you, okay? Because this is supposed to be something where we look at the mirror and then we look at God's Word and we have to see if what we're seeing in the mirror reflects what we're seeing in God's Word. That's the whole point of tonight's message. Uh, so just, just warning you up front, but also know that I'm not trying to like just kick you while you're down. I'm just trying to help get you to understand that there could be something more to following Christ in your life. That's the goal tonight. So, uh, that's, that's my warning, and so don't cry over it. Okay. As World War II ended in 1945, there were many high-profile court cases taking place all over the world. And many of these cases were, were built around the idea of people conspiring with the Nazis. And one of these cases uh, was with an individual who was a Dutch artist and art dealer named Han von Meheren. I'm trying to say it right, it's art. Von Meheren. It's really weird. He was accused of selling historical Dutch pieces of art to the Nazis. Uh, and, they, and they tried to do a calculation if the historical pieces of art, if they were sold for the money that he made, it would have been somewhere around $7 million U.S. dollars today. So, of course, you can imagine after the war, they're like, why were you talking with the Nazis, let alone selling them our historical art so that they could trash it? Giving up our culture to them. If found guilty... He probably would have received the death penalty. And when he shows up to court, his defense is really strange. Because you're probably thinking like, oh, well, he's probably going to plead not guilty and have some reason or some excuse. But when he shows up, he pleads not guilty. And whenever they ask him why is he plead not guilty, he says, because those aren't historical pieces of art, but they're forgeries that I did myself. Yeah. 
So during his trial, he then explained all of his techniques that he used to forge art, not just for the Nazis, but he had been doing it for almost 30 years and selling it and passing it off as historical art to people all across the world. It's quite amazing. At first they were like, we don't believe you. This, this, this is an original art piece. By our beloved artists. He goes, no, I did that in my basement. They wouldn't believe him, so what he did was he took him and he, and he showed him all of his paints that he had made that were, as he made, he made them according to the different ways that they would make them back in the 1700s and the 1600s, so that whenever the paint dried, it dried exactly like how it was supposed to for it to be a historical piece of art. Not only that, but he used a special substance that he put in all of his paints that made it dry hard like it had been there for a long time. Not only that, he was, he was pretty good at art. So it wasn't like me trying to draw a stick figure and go, Mona Lisa. No, like he was actually good at art, and what he produced, sometimes people were like, this is even better than the original. And because of that, he was one of the, th actually what they made him do to prove his innocence, he actually painted a forgery live in front of, people so that they could prove that he actually was the one to do it, which he did. He proved his innocence and pleaded guilty to for, forging art and uh, would have served a year in jail, but he ended up dying of a heart attack before he even served his one-year sentence. He became a folk <laughs> hero because he had tricked the Nazis and stolen their money with fake art. His paintings were so good that not only did the Nazis not know that they weren't real, but also famous art critics and art experts couldn't tell the difference. Even after his death, there was one painting that they came across. They were like, oh, this must be an original, but it wasn't. It was one of his fakes. When we look at the New Testament and we see what is happening in the lives of the disciples, when we look at how they lived for the gospel and how they picked up their cross daily to live for him, and then we compare that to the way we live out our faith, it would be hard to believe that we could confuse people about faith. What do I mean by that? I, I, if we're, if, we're the, if we're the Han von Mehern who made this art that's fake and it got passed off and all these people believed it was real, if we look at the faith of the disciples in the New Testament as they lived it out and then we compare that to our lives, I think it wouldn't match up the same. We definitely couldn't pass it off to the Nazis we definitely couldn't pass it off to the experts. Maybe in some cases, there wouldn't even be enough similarity to confuse an infant or a stray dog, if we're honest. And we wonder why the world is so lost in the post of the gospel, yet so many times we fail to even examine our own walk and see if that is the difference. See, for the disciples, their message, their brand, what they put out there to the world was clear. If you were to ask, why are you here, disciples? They would probably say something like, we are here to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Simple. No, but like, why are you here? We are here on earth, in this place, in this time, for this reason, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. What would our message be? As, as we read tonight, as we get into it, what I hope that we see is that we must make sure that our message to our school, team, neighborhood, family, is the same message that was proclaimed and lived by the disciples. Because our calling is exactly the same. 
We need to make sure that our message to our school team, neighborhood, and family is the same message that was proclaimed and lived by the disciples of the New Testament. So let's, let's go ahead and jump into Scripture tonight. We're going to be in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13. Continuing in Acts, as we kind of look at the full focus of what the disciples did after Jesus ascended into heaven. There's this cool moment that happens in the church at Antioch, where they're all praying and they're all gathering together. They're raising up and new leaders, and then all of a sudden, uh, as they're praying and as they're worshiping, God says, send Paul and Barnabas. Send Paul and Barnabas. Send your two best leaders. Send them out. And they pray and they go, yes, Lord, here they go. We'll be fine without them. Go. And then in chapter 13, verse 4, it says this. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So the first thing that I want you to see tonight, as we look at the life of the disciples here, of, of the apostles, Paul and Barnabas, is that they were sent. And so are you. You are sent. You are sent. <clears throat> Not smelly. That'd be S-C-E-N-T. You are sent. Meaning you have a direction. Meaning you are being guided. Meaning you have a destination. When we're sent, it also is kind of a push in the back saying go. Go. Move. See, God has placed you in your school, on your team, in your family, and in your neighborhood, just like he led Paul and Barnabas to Cyprus. So just like the Spirit moved in their hearts and said, go to Cyprus, for you, he has placed you exactly where you are, in whatever situation you're in, for a reason. He's called you there. He has sent you here. But our, our attitude towards these different places often questions the providence of God in this area of our lives. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we get a bad attitude and, and we, we think, oh, I wish I didn't go to this school. Wish I did. I, why, why am I here? I don't want to be here. <clears throat> Maybe we wanted to make varsity, but we made JV instead. Well, I, I want to be on varsity. I belong on varsity. I, I, I don't want to play with these guys. I don't want to, or these girls. I don't want to do this. I don't want to be, I don't want to be in the second band. I want to be in the top band. I don't want to be here. I want to be here. I don't want to be with these people. Maybe you feel that way about your family. I wish I was a part of that family. They let them have whatever they want. They get all these nice things. They get to do whatever they want to do. Why don't, why don't I get to live that life? Why don't my parents let me have all those things or do those things? Maybe you just don't even want to live here in Conroe or in Montgomery County. You, just, you want to live in a different town or different house, different neighborhood. I wish I didn't live in this apartment. I want, I want a house. See, our, our attitude often reflects a lack of trust in the providence of God. God has placed you where you are in the, in the situations that you're in for a specific reason, for his sake and for the gospel, and yet we often are just too busy and too consumed with how you don't like it. And that attitude actually keeps you from being able to fulfill the mission you've been called to do. Let's look back at the Old Testament for an example. 
Y'all remember a guy named Jonah? Y'all remember what happened to Jonah? So God actually speaks with Jonah, and what does he do? Calls him to what? Go preach to who? Some people called the Ninevites from Nineveh. There's a problem. The Ninevites have killed the Jewish people for, for a long time. They've been at war. They're wicked, evil people. They're, they're against each other. They're enemies. And so Jonah goes, no, God, I'm not doing that. He actually gets on a boat and tries to run from God, which is just absurd. If we just think about it for a second. God sends the storm. Jonah's like, you know what? I'm just going to jump off this boat and kill myself. And that will get rid of the storm and everybody will live and everybody will be happy. God has another plan. He swallows him with a big fish. So Jonah has a moment with God, gets his heart right, says, okay, I'm going to go to Nineveh. God's like, yeah, darn straight you are. <laughs> Because I'm God, I'm sending you there. And that's what I want to do, and that's what's going to happen. That's the providence of God. The fish vomits him out on the beach, right in front of Nineveh. But does Jonah's heart really change? Does he really want to be in Nineveh? Does he really want the Ninevites to change? No. After all those things he's been through, he goes into Nineveh and all the craziness is happening around him and he stands up to speak and he goes, Repent or you're all going to die. You're all going to die. And he, he leaves. He gives the most passionless and rotten sermon that lacks grace or hope. And God, being God, still uses it. But at the same time, the book of Jonah ends with Jonah being upset at God because he saved the Ninevites. He spared them. And I feel like that's our heart and our attitude. We're saved by God. We do not deserve any of this grace that he has given us. And yet we look at our situation every single day that we wake up and we go, I wish I wasn't here. God, I know you've saved me. I know you've called me. I know that you have given me all these blessings in my life, but I don't want to be here. I don't want to be in this situation. And it's impossible to go out on mission for Christ whenever you're pushing back against the very mission that he's given you and called you to. It's impossible. No one will want to hear from you if you're too good for them or discontent with where God has called you. Because they'll see it. They'll see it. They'll look at you and they'll, they'll see the, well, let me just, I don't want to be here, but, you know, God's cool. Jesus saves. They don't want to hear that. Well, I should be on varsity, but since I'm not, I guess I'll just lead the prayer. Doesn't, doesn't work, does it? You are sent. You, you are sent. All right, let's, let's look at verse 5. See what else happens. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had John to assist them. Alright, so they were sent, and what were they sent to do? What did they do? <coughs> they proclaimed the word of God. So, one, you are sent to do what? To? To proclaim the word of God. As soon as they arrived, they had a message, and they were ready to give it. Alright, so, 
they arrive to the town, and the first thing that they do is they go where they need to go, and then they start proclaiming the word of God. So let's let's transfer that to our world, to your situation, to your life. Yeah, and I just want I'm gonna kind of get in your head a little bit because you know, back in my day, I used to be a junior high student, a high school student. Okay, so I I'm gonna to try to get in your head a little bit, a little bit. What do you think when you get out of the car or off the bus and head into school? Are you looking for ways to begin sharing the message or something else? So here, just, here, here's where I'm, I'm trying to go with this. Um, maybe you get to school and you get out of the car. And as you're opening the car, maybe even on the way to school it starts, but you're getting out of the car and then the anxiety sets in. Why? Because you realize that that homework assignment that you were supposed to do for first period last night after the game didn't get done. And now you're trying to problem solve in your head on the go because you've got about 30 minutes before class starts. <laughs> Or practice starts because you had to get to school early for practice. And you're trying to figure out how you're going to get this done, but also do what you need to do, and all that's going on. You decide maybe some of my friends can help me, so you go and try to find your friends. Because you know in your head that if you fail another assignment, that means that your grade's going to go from an A to a B, and then your parents are going to take away your video games, <coughs> your car keys, your fill-in-the-blank. And as you're stressing about that, oh no, the person you like is now talking with somebody else instead of with you because you're too busy doing your homework that you forgot to do. So now you're panicking because you were texting last night, but now she's talking or he's talking to somebody else. Did you do something wrong? Did I screw this up? Wait, I have to focus. I only have 10 minutes left. But somehow you finish the assignment. Bell rings. And then now as the day goes, you get caught up in all the social and you get caught up in the social and academic engagement of the day. You just go from class to class. You have your friends in each of your classes, you tell jokes, you listen to jokes, you talk about things that don't matter. All of a sudden, eighth period come, or whatever the last period of day comes, and, and it's over, and then it's, then it's practice, and there's all the all the stuff that goes with that, and you just wear yourself out. And then you get home, it's late. You try to talk to their, your parents, but they they're tired too because they they've been working all day or whatever. You eat, you do what you need to do, you spend some time on social media, you watch TV, and you go to sleep, and you get ready to do it all over again. Sound familiar? Rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. <coughs> and see that that life that may get you some A's in school, that may get you into college, it may it may even eventually get you a job that can earn you enough money to, to make a living and, and have a house and and support a family. Don't get me wrong, you'll survive. You may even become successful but you'll never live a life of significance. You'll get all the things that the world tells you that you need to have, but you'll miss out on one thing, the one thing you've actually been called to do. See, significance comes when we eliminate the things that take the place of God, and then focus solely on the mission of God, which is to share the message of God. Yes, we do our schoolwork the best we can. We give our very best effort on our teams and our, our places. We love our families well. We do all those things. But the mission and the message all, must always come first. So that means that we need to plan and prioritize. That means that we need to make sure that we get things done ahead of time when we need to do them so that we're ready to be able to 
move forward on mission with a message for God. Now, let's jump down to the end of the chapter. This is verse 48. You might have to flip a page or so. Paul has shared the gospel boldly. And let's see what happens in 48 through 52 of Acts 13. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as were appointed to eternal life believed. And the word of the Lord was spreading throughout the whole region, but the Jews incited the devout women of high standing and the leading men of the city stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of their district. But they shook off the dust from their feet against them and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. See, something amazing happens uh, when, when we step into the mission that we've been called to and we proclaim the message that God has given us. See, what happens is that God moves around us and we're able to be a part of it. And we see here that a great movement of God happened where people believed in the gospel and received it and became followers of Christ. Happily ever, ever after? No. Some people didn't like what was going on and pushed back against them. And even though they were pushed back against, and even though they had to shake the dust off their feet and leave, and even though that now they had a, a new, new family members in Christ, even though they had this family, they had to leave and go be homeless again. And what does it say in verse 52? And the disciples were filled with what? Joy. And the Holy Spirit. So how, how will this look? How will this look whenever we first know that we're sent and that we proclaim the word of God. How does this look? It's going to look like we have joy and, and full of the Holy Spirit. We're going to be full of joy and the Holy Spirit. Let's be honest. The, 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 one, the one thing that really holds us back from living a life abandoned to God if we dig down deep enough, it's not that we don't think it's true or that we don't think it's, it's the right thing to do. I think, honestly, it's deep down we feel like we're going to miss out on something. You're probably sitting there right now like, man, that, that's cool, but like, I miss out on all these things with my friends that I feel like I need to do. But let's think about it from the opposite. Maybe, just maybe, because you're so caught up in all of these things that don't really matter, you're missing out on something much greater than the temporary happiness that can come from those eternally meaningless things. Maybe we need to start asking, what does this mean eternally to me? When I've lived my life out to the last of my days that God has appointed for me, and when I stand before him, what's going to really matter? What's going to really matter? Was it the parties I went to, or the hangouts I was at? Was it all my accomplishments? Or was it when I was faithful and said yes to him and followed him and took the message to people? I think it's about a year ago, maybe a little longer than that, I brought my box of trophies up here and I started showing you all my dumb trophies from when I was a kid. And now they sit in a box. They don't mean anything. 
The woman goes, hey, remember that trophy you won? What are you missing out on? 50, verse 52 says they were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. We all desire joy. But we've, we've been taught for so long that it comes from other wells. We've been taught, hey, if you want joy, then you need to be really good at your sport. Or you need to be really good at music. Or you need to be really good at dance. And in order to be really good, you have to sell your soul to it. You have to give your life up. You have Every waking moment of your life, you just have to give to it. And you're like, oh, so you're saying if I go there and I go to that well, then I, and I'm going to receive joy? And what happens is, is we get there, we do all the work, we lower our bucket, and we pull it back up and it's empty. And we know it's empty. But then we look around and those same people go, just do it again. You'll get joy. So you're like, okay, I get because you told me so and I trust you because you're an adult. Or you're whoever. Empty. It actually becomes even more dry than whenever you lowered it in to begin with, if that's even possible. We wonder why we're so stressed and angry and frustrated and disgruntled and tired and worn down and discontent. The problem is, is that we're looking for the diamond of joy in a porta potty. <coughs> joy doesn't come from anything in this world. Has it only comes from a relationship with the Christ, and then. The filling of that joy comes when we walk with him. And the overflow of that joy comes when we walk with him and share the message that he's given us. So I just want you to know, if you don't have a relationship with Christ tonight, you can experience true joy for the first time. By giving your life to Jesus. The message that the disciples carried in Acts is the same Message, the same good news for us today, that Jesus died for us, that we might be saved. If you've never believed in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, I, I just invite you to come talk to me, come talk to one of our other adult helpers tonight. They, they would love to talk to you about what it means to, to follow Jesus and give your life to him. Because we want you to experience joy, and most importantly, we want you to experience life, eternal life in him. Because it can only come from Him. Maybe tonight you've given your life to Jesus, but your lifestyle really hasn't changed. If you if you were asked if you were asked, are you a Christian? You'd be like, yes, I'm a Christian. And they go, why? You'd be like, well, because Jesus died for my sins, and I believe in Him and trust Him with my life. Awesome, great. But then they look at your life and they go, then why do you look so? Frustrated, just like everybody else. And why do you do all the things that everybody else does? And why have I never heard the message of the good news from you? It's because you've been, you're trying to chase, you're trying to chase diamonds in the wrong place. Maybe tonight as we pray here in a second, it's just as simple as you offering up a prayer on your own and just asking God and allowing God to change your heart. Saying, God, I, I know I, I haven't changed. I know I haven't, my life hasn't adjusted to, to following you, but I truly want to follow you and I want to share your message as you've called me to do. So change my heart, shape my heart. Make, make something happen. Make me different. Reshape who I am so that I'm the type of person who brings your message to the world.
So if that's you, I'll just invite you as we pray to pray that on your own where you're at. Just to yourself, to God. Have, have a moment <laughs> by yourself. Uh, let's, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for tonight and the fact that we can just gather together and study your word together. God, I pray. Help us to see the fact that we are sent right here for a reason. That we've been called to the school, the teams, the families, that we've been called to for a reason. So God, help us to see that and trust that. Help us to understand that we haven't been sent here just to live our lives and, and do things for ourselves to build our kingdom, but we've been called and sent with a message. That we have the message of the gospel to proclaim to the world. That we should do the things that are necessary so that we can pave the way to be able to share that good news with those around us. And God, ultimately we want to experience joy. But we don't want a fake substitute that this world has to offer. We want the real thing. And we know that that only comes from you. So God, we desire a deeper relationship with you that then sparks us and leads us and guides us to go and share your word. That's us all in Jesus' name. Amen.